I will talk about carbon, and I think that the importance of the first slide is if you hear carbon, it's not only about graphene and nanotubes. And in many of my lectures, I usually am faced with this preconception that carbon is, is just layers, yeah? And it's not like that, because I guess carbons are not a single material, but a class of materials, like metals. And we have zinc and we have gold, so they can be very different, yeah? To, to the surprise of many people, they can be made by soil gel polymerizations, they can be made in water. You don't rely on high temperatures, vacuum, and all these techniques. I will show that, yeah. And as in metals, you can adjust electronic character rather freely. So I will present you a variation of Fermi levels of more than two volt today. So some of the carbons are more noble than even ruthenium dioxide, yeah. So it's, it comes to a surprise, but if you understand the principles, I think it's very easy. acid base character, frustrated Lewis pairs, all the things important for chemistry can be easily integrated. And of course, this allows catalysis with carbons as such. And of course, the, the propaganda is, if I would have to choose a material for the 21st century, of course, it would be carbon, together with all the other elements, because we are living in a plural society. Yeah. So first I will talk indeed about hydrothermal carbonization. And hydrothermal carbonization is really something like the soil gel chemistry. I need that for introduction. It's old work, <laughs> 10, partly 100 years old. These are the structures we want to make. And this clearly shows you this is not layered graphene, not nanotubes. So you see wonderful homogeneous spherical particles, rod as, rods as you might like them for fillers, for batteries, or down below even a sponge, which is good for ion exchange, supercapacitance, or catalysis. Yeah. And all these structures you know very well because they could have been made from silica. So what we did, did we do? We just applied all the rules we know from silica and we applied them for carbons. And in then in the very end, the monomer in this case is ordinary sugar. Glucose, it can be starch, cellulose, yeah. What hydrothermal polymerization does, very similar to silica, first you turn the monomer into a reactive monomer. In this case, not by hydrolysis, but by dehydration, yeah. It runs in water, and then because it is in water, we can play with a hydrophilic hydrophobic contrast, and we can really use interface effects, self-organization effects, to make all the structures on the colloidal scale. And the whole thing is run with a carbon efficiency of around one, which means practically all the carbon starting in the monomer <coughs> is ending up at the carbon structures, sugar, water, very efficient, it's green chemistry in the very end, yeah? It's not old, it's not new. Friedrich Bergius, Nobel laureate, described all the techniques in 1913. Those days there were, of course, no electron microscopes, but he knew already a lot, and in the very end, everything here is a reinvention. Yeah. This is how it works. Yeah. It's incredibly cheap, so on industrial scale, we can make carbons for 200 euro per ton. And for many of the applications I will talk about, this is an absolutely key feature. So all the superior functionalities come for no price if you apply these techniques. Then the nanostructures I will show, of course, and the chemistry is even easily understood for the public. Carbohydrate contains carbon and water in the name. You split off the water, you end up with the carbon. The side product is water, yeah? Let's do something fancy to show it. It's really sol gel. Yeah, Q dots, all the stuff. This is sol gel chemistry, of course. These are nanoparticles. I prefer to make a coating. So I will take a particle, a latex particle, and I will make a tiny, even graphene shell around this particle, yeah, just by using the particle, decomposing the carbohydrate, and allowing this sol gel growth onto the particle. This is how it looks, yeah, and I usually I'm a very honest person, so I always to, to, to show all paper. This is maybe one million particles, and you see all of them look the same. And you see, see zoom in, and you really see all the particles are hollow, partly fractured, this is a problem, but you see hollow spheres made from a very thin graphene shell. The layer here is 10 nanometer, and we could zoom in, and if you do the temperature right, you have a graphitization, of course, for the price of two euro per kilogram. This, this is the big advantage of sol gel chemistry. And this is the filled sphere, this is the empty sphere. You see surface area, poor volume, all the stuff really nicely complies with the picture which is in TM. So in fact, we can access the interior of all the particles. This is the pore volume, this is an ink bottle pore, and the surface area is exactly what we see over here. We, say we, we have what we see. 
If we fill now this stuff with other stuff, and this here is metallurgic silicon, it looks like that, we can of course uh, put, apply this layer onto silicon. Now pictures are a little bit more difficult. We have to etch away the silicon, but you see it's still these graphene shells. And the idea, of course, is in this case to address nanoscopic silicon, which is the cheap one, so it's the metallurgic one, not the semiconductor one, yeah, by conductivity. Silicon is a beast. If you want to build a battery on that, it has two problems. First, it's not conductive or not conductive enough. And secondly, throughout the uptake of lithium, yeah, it expands enormously. And if you want to name that, it's a flexible shopping bag. This is why it's not allowed to be parallel graphene, yeah, which expands its crumpled graphene, expands with the lithium uptake, mm -hmm. and this is why we can create a battery. Again, very old work, yeah, I have to say, together with Joachim Meyer, and it's not easy. You have to seal the little bags yeah, with the right secondary component, many experiments, but in the very end, what you see, the specific capacity is here stable for 1,000 cycles, 1,200 milliampere uh, hours per gram. This is three times the value of graphene. This is no surprise, it's easily understood. I just want to say, uh, such a simple process really results in a very, very good anode material for the lithium ion battery with all the advantages, including an extremely uh, favorable rate behavior. And here I really want to underline the rate behavior because this is brought in by the highly conductive carbon, which is not in the silicon course. The other side, cathode here, we fill these little bags with sulfur. So we put in sulfur, and the idea is exactly the same, because the sulfur should turn into sulfide, so it's the other electrode. It will change volume polarity, but the original idea was, of course, that this is occurring just in this little cell. It's really like a little power plant in an animal cell. So nothing was allowed to leach out, yeah, and here, as you already see, the stability is slightly fading. For a sulfur battery, this is very, very stable, but you see still after 50, 50 cycles. So here the problem is to seal the little bags, which we can very good on a Yanot side, but not on the cathode side. Yeah. But nevertheless, we can have safely here 800 milliampere hours per gram, finally 600 milliampere hour per gram, which is also three times the value of a lithium ion battery. Yeah. Again, a very, very cheap solution. Here, not ready to apply it on, to the market, but if you take a typical Ragoni plot, you see the power energy curve is so well above all lithium ion batteries and even the advanced line lithium ion batteries, which essentially to the soldier chemistry of carbon. So we, we did nothing than adding a little carbon, but we added it in a way as a chemist wants to have it, and this is the difference. Supercapacitors, and we'll not talk about it, yeah, because we have one of the world-leading supercapacitors experts. Here, the only message is the figure of merit here is 250, 300 farads per gram. The curves look perfect. The rate behavior is excellent. And the only statement is you don't need graphene. This is biomass carbon. The biomass carbon, again, comes for a price of 1 or 2 euro per kilogram. It's sustainable, made in water, and this type of carbon can do the same as highly advanced engineering operations, delamination, loading with, no, we don't need that. It's more simple. Let's move on because this was old stuff. I want to talk about uh, carbons from ionic liquids and salt templating because this allows me to elaborate on the Fermi level variations. We vary the Fermi level in the very end by doping, doping techniques and alternations of the electronic structures by incorporation of functional groups. This is how ionic liquids look like, and the reason why we took it is it has a nice chemistry for cross-linkings. It's like a monomer, and it does not run away. It does not evacuate. It has a no, no volatility, no boiling point, so this poor molecule has to wait until it's condensed and carbonized, and this was the original intention. But already the first experiments, this is violet, and you don't see it in the picture, tell us that the carbon is changing. Typical monomers, for tutorial reasons, no metal inside, because we want to do metal-free catalysis, and such systems, of course, can be purified. So we have an anion and cation, both are organic. This is inorganic, yeah, and then it's heated. You lose a lot of mass here, 70% even, but you have no hydrogen in the final product and typically content of around 10% of nitrogen. This is a magic number, I should say. You can start as you like, you always end up at least 12%, because these 12% nitrogen make carbon more stable than carbon. 
So it's thermodynamics in the very end driving the composition to this point. This is the real thing. If you make such a carbon, it does not look like carbon. So obviously, this little piece, this little medaille though, is of course uh, carbon. It's not gold. But it has essentially the electronic, the electrons at the Fermi level of gold, of a metal. It's so highly doped that it's super conductive. It beats graphene easily, and you see it looks like noble carbon and this noble carbon because this has a Fermi level of plus one volt, this stuff. More noble than gold. Fermi levels are nice, they're for physicists. This is for chemists and true kids. So I show you what we do with this carbon, and I hope I can show it. This is a nanostructure with 2,000 square meters per gram, and I put it in the oxidizing part of a flame. I will heat up this stuff to 1,100 degrees centigrade. It will be white glowing. It's porous because heat conduction is very lousy. It stays at the top front, as you see, so I'm telling you the truth. <coughs> and it has to glow with this Planck radiation, but it does not burn. And if you know the invention of black powder, gunpowder, which contains, of course, a lot of carbon, nanocarbon burns like hell. Not this one, because it's noble. Yeah? This is the point. So this is the meaning of a Fermi level of plus one volt. It's undestroyable, and of course, this makes it a very attractive base not only for heat insulations and spaceships and so on, but also for catalysis. <coughs> because what is not allowed is that the catalyst support dies throughout the reactions, which are usually very nasty. So we have to engineer that, and here we use indeed the fact that this is like sol gel or, or polymer. We can do, for instance, electrospinning. So we are electrospinning our nanotubes, applying a typical technology for polymers or sol gel. Yeah and then making such things. This is an electrode. You see, the electron is electrospun, it's cross-linked, and of course it has the right porosity to address uh, other stuff. Nitrogen content in this case, 8%. If you need a more open uh, tube, yeah, for cells for instance, you, you spin less. So not very complicated. This is how it looks like, it's mechanically stable. The, the conductivity of the super porous system, this is 95%, is 200 Siemens per centimeter. This is really a metal-like conductivity, and you might see it, it's transparent gold. It's not black. Yeah. So this is the type of electrode we can fabricate, of course. Electrospinning is a square meter technology on any scale. This is cyclovoltimetry. This is a nanotube electrode, and we are running the cyclovoltagram very fast that the system has to collapse. So this is a not nice experiment, because you can always make a material fail by running too fast. Yeah. We do the same with the golden stuff, and you see the transfer factor, as it is called, is 10,000 times better. So even at these very high rates, we do, of course, of the fact, of course, mainly the interconnects between the nanotubes, which are chemically cross-linked. Yeah, so there's a material, that, there's not a tunnel gap, so to say, between uh, the fibers. This is the reason why the structure is so much better. Larger nanoporous membranes, and now we're coming into the real <coughs> stuff. You see, this is a hand. This is such a membrane made from the precursor. This is polymer processing in the very end, and you know, membranes can be very big. This is how the membrane looks like. And you see, it's a sponge. It's nanopores through and through. And I have to tell you, this is carbon, yeah? So we take the polymer, we make these sol gel transformations, we turn the green body in the carbon membrane, and you have a nanoporous membrane, pore size 30 to 100 nanometer, and you have it in one piece. One big piece. And this is, of course, what you need for, uh, for electrocatalysis, for electrolysis, for separation membranes. Yeah. Same membrane here we add just for tutorials, and I always have to point that I am usually uh, work with many co-authors. Here we added little cobalt particles inside, and they are encapsulated in graphene. And you see a lot of things, but for, for instance, you see the conductivity of this membrane, it's 200 Siemens per centimeter. This is carbon nanotube, graphene paper, all the classical things are down here. The conductivity is, of course, better because we made band gap engineering to increase the conductivity. This is the important thing. We use it for water electrolysis, and here, really, for tutorial reason, an overpotential on the hydrogen side of 200 millivolt is non acceptable, but we just do it. Yeah? On the oxygen side, it's fantastic. 320 millivolts, and you see, this is not games, this is 150 milliampere current, 
This is 90 milliampere current. This is what usually academic persons don't show because membranes burn away. <coughs> the resistive heat at those uh, currents is so high that usually the membranes burn away. Not in our case, of course, it's very, very stable. And also here, I have a very funny video. Here we cooperate with Saudi Arabia, and I hope it works. Ooh -hoo. No, okay. It, it must be like that. Yes. You see Saudi Arabia, you see a solar cell, 18 volt, and this is the rate we produce hydrogen. Of course, this is standard electrolysis, yeah? The efficiency is 71%, and the real killer is this is run with 18 volt. Yeah, so we don't make any voltage modulation. The material is so stable that we can run it with brutal over potentials. Yeah? Please remember, 1100 degrees centigrade in oxygen. This is about the same situation that any stupid can use this electrolyzer because we have, don't need these very careful adjustive electronics which are so much needed for modern electrolyzers, not in this case. It's meant to be simple and it is simple. The good thing is we can do other things, of course. Once you have entered this field, you understand the new opportunities. And here we use salt, and the other chairperson, David, is an expert for salt melts. We take ionic liquids, we, we add, make, of course, end of COVID from the ionic liquids, but we add salt. And salt and ionic liquids, all are ionic, they mix. Yeah? It turns a little solid, as you see, but nevertheless, if you make a carbon under these conditions, you get... This is the same amount, obviously a porous material. So I always try to teach my student that they should look what they have, and if something is very fluffy and large and not like dense like that, it's obvious that the salt indeed. So what happened? The ionic liquid solidified around the salt. Then the salt acts as a template, as we say, in porous material. All this, we use low melting salts, is occurring at 300 degrees centigrade, so well below the decomposition temperature we can start at the homogeneous situation, and this is how it works. The carbons are incredible, I have to say, because if we take, for instance, this famous mixture is a low melting eutectic. This is the one micron scale, you see, it's homogeneous. No cracks, nothing, yeah, this is just an edge, of course, yeah. So obviously the material creeps its cohesion. The same is true for the sodium chloride, zinc chloride, potassium chloride. Here you see it, that it starts to the mix. So obviously, potassium is very hard, and throughout the carbon condensation, it starts to do this, this demixing, whereas the two, the, those two guys obviously stay about homogeneous. We think in those two cases here, this is demixing, this is TM, 50 nanometer. 50 nanometer is too big, this is a physical phase. It has demixed. Yeah? But here and here, this is equilibrium, <coughs> and here we think we really see iron pairs, as like in zeolites, and here, obviously, the system lives in little clusters. Clusters of maybe 10, 20 iron pairs, but this seems to be the equilibrium situation. So a wonderful analytical technique to learn about the physics of iron pairs in carbon. Yeah. So this is the illustration. And of course, again, this is very nicely reflected in the, it's fading. You see, this system is just micropores, so these are very small pores. And this is the picture we created from those curves. So obviously, we can use simple salts to adjust pores. And again, sodium chloride is not very expensive. So this is a thing. And you can remove the salt by washing with water. It's a dream reaction in terms of green chemistry. No mass loss, a very simple template, can be recycled. Yeah. And obviously, we can do a lot. I'm ready to state that we can do pork control with angstrom precision because we can adjust mixing, demixing, or the cluster size simply by mixing the chemical species. Yeah, and you choose a pore for the carbon, you get it. And this is the process. Essentially, it's a cyclic process. The salt then is evaporated and comes back, and you start to mix it again. This turned already industrial, I have to say. What you see here is acrodam. It's so to say the polyacrylonitrile of end of carbon. So acrodam is the one, two, three, four tetramer of HCN. It's the part of HCN chemistry, which is practically forgotten. But in Germany, we still have big factories of 150,000 tons per year, which do essentially uh, 
calcium cyanides and the resulting chemistry. It's the old chemistry to make organic molecules. And you see that, indeed, the pore size of these materials using acrodam and the salt templating is partly enormous. Very small pores, but enormous pores. Cohesive materials. Yeah. And if you really go through the table, you see certain cases have 3,200 square meters per gram. And it's a 60% efficiency synthesis. No etching, no delamination. Yeah. These numbers are very big, but also I, I can illustrate them fully exfoliated graphene has 2,600 square meters. So if you have two six square meters, every carbon atom is sitting at two surfaces. So these sitting obviously at more than two surfaces, every carbon atom can attach, so to say, even three or four coordination sites. Much more open than graphene and very systematic. So there is physical chemistry in behind. Also here, supercapacitance I will not talk about, same figures of merits. The exciting thing here is indeed that these pores can be filled with reactive solvents, hydroquinone or iodide, ion-3. All of them can be formulated at very high concentration, and then the solvent is redox active. And if you then make such a measurement, you see, you can very easily reach 1,000 farad per gram. 1,000 farad per gram. <coughs> I should say this even beats the nickel hydride battery. Yeah? And it's just carbon, sulfuric acid, hydroquinone, iodide, so things which are rather simple. Yeah. No uh, running out resources. Yeah. This is, in the very end, the energy density, uh, 100 watt hour per kilogram, still below the lithium ion battery, I understand. Yeah. And again, another thing of those batteries is it fades quite quickly. And you can ask yourself, why is this structure fading away so quickly? This is because it's not a supercapacitor, but more a battery. And indeed, to here, a chemical reaction has to occur. This is not only transfer of an electron. Really, the hydroquinone has to come to the surface of the carbon, has to take the electron, has to go back. And if you can do that on a time scale of 10 seconds, it's still very fast. It's incredibly fast electrochemistry, but not really just uh, electricity flow. I will jump maybe over that. Yeah. Let's use this stuff now as a catalyst. I told you, indeed, that um, this is like platinum. And if we can adjust the Fermi level, we can also adjust acid-base character, hydrogen absorption, oxygen absorption. This essentially is now in our hands, because absorption, as we know in interface chemistry, is not very molecular. It's mainly driven by polarization forces. And this is something which is not only owned by metals, but also by all substances. Polymers can absorb oxygen. Yeah? So what we do here is what I call the, the breathing of machines, which is oxygen reduction reaction. Any fuel cell, of course, has to take the oxygen, and the oxygen has to be reduced. It turns into O minus, OH minus in the very end. Yeah? And this is currently driven by platinum, and platinum is expensive and bad for this reaction. But no choice in fuel cell cars. You have to do that. We do the same with one of these special carbons. We take, in this case, something like that. It's a typical aerogel. And aerogels turned out to be very good for ternary fa phase boundaries, because it's a ternary phase boundary of carbon solution and the gas to be activated. And if you see these curves here in the very end, this is platinum carbon. This is a poor carbon. You see, indeed, that this carbon, at high rates, uh, it's Close to the platinum, I have to say. Here it's even better than the platinum. I should explain what it is. One is alkaline, one is acidic. Yeah? And uh, obviously, this carbon can do a platinum-like reaction with the same speed and the same efficiency. Yeah? You don't need platinum for fuel cells. Because the reason is you can fake a carbon, which doing is exactly the same with very high efficiencies. Yeah? This is the lifetime. The problem is oxidations are always huh? So, and it also degrades, but it degrades less than platinum, which means it's only slightly no more noble than platinum. We still have to work on nobility with certain tricks. It's not the end. It's not an observation of us. Meanwhile, you see, I collected Mirren, Klaus Mirren, Dai, Sheng Dai, Sun, all the guys. We contributed in a variety of fashion. This is a 
densification of everything you find in the literature in a single master curve. So it means it does not depend on synthesis, the type of carbon, yeah, the lab it is made in. Yeah, obviously, all the systems are about similar, and even the little differences in engineering do not show up. It's proven carbon can replace platinum in many reactions. However, and this is important to understand, platinum is a good metal, but it shows so many catalytic reactions that sometimes another catalytic reaction, a side reaction, it is its weakness. Carbons can be made to be specialists for only one reaction. And this is the standard problem of platinum in the fuel cell. It's a so-called pool spillover. So this is a fuel cell, a little model fuel cell. You add oxygen, the reaction is running. Yeah. You add methanol, the, the catalyst is dying because the methanol, of course, is oxidized to CO. CO is binding to the platinum, and you would have to heat your car to 400 degrees centigrade to, re to restore the platinum. So it means broken. Yeah, a counter current, yeah, and then over. This is why the management of methanol must be very sensitive in all these fuel cells. If you do that with us, and this indeed are bubbles, yeah, don't forget it's oxygen, so it has to fluctuate at least with us. Yeah, you add methanol, the system does not care at all. Yeah, you can even take dirty fuel, the system does not care at all. So all the things you learn, H2 is polluted with CO and we cannot use it because of that. Not true if you use a carbon catalyst, because carbon catalysts can be made to be tolerant against side products because they only show one rate. Yeah. H2O2, the much better reaction, uh, currently a product produced in industry for one euro per kilogram by the antraquinone process, two cents per kilogram if you do it with a special car. I, I speed up because this is my most beloved reaction. It's in the very end, the conversion of CO2 with electric current. It's a so-called dream reaction, and we know it works, and if you talk to specialists, usually they say, kappa, yeah. This is a carbon at carbon heterojunction hybrid, and I will explain later what it means. We take nanotubes, we take the classical membrane processing, and we put nanotubes into the other carbon. Then you have two carbons, and as one is more noble than the other, spontaneous electron flow will occur. Yeah? Namely, the less noble voltaic element, carbon will send the electrons to the more noble element, and then you have a plus and a minus in an uncharged system, and this is what you call a frustrated Lewis pair. Yeah? So it works automatically. And again, this I have to present a long list, including my friend Jeff Ozen. Yeah? This is joint work of many, many, many labs. This is how it looks. You see, this is the nanotube, and then we put this end of carbon on top. You see the previous structure, and in the previous structure, now you even sense the many nanotubes on the inside. In this special system, you take a soda, which is carbon dioxide in water, you apply current, and you end up with formic acid. All in water, just carbon, no metal, efficiency at the right voltage, I have to be careful, 80%. Coulombic efficiency. So the side reaction, which is hydrogen generation, <coughs> is there. The overpotential is high. Yes, it's 0.4 volt. We kill the reaction. But what's the secret of this reaction? Why can we apply such high overpotentials to run the reactions? Because the system is not generating hydrogen. It's a selective catalyst. And as it does not, the side reaction, create hydrogen, it will reduce the CO2. 80% efficiency. Uh, this will revolutionize, of course, the formic acid market because formic acid is good for a number of things, and obviously the price again is now in the, of the order of five to ten cents per kilogram. Donor acceptor carbons, yeah, electronic tiling. Yeah, this is in the very end what we do, and we do for another reason. If this is graphene, and again it's not graphene, we take spots in it which have a higher or lower electron density. In photovoltaic polymers, this is well known, it's called donor acceptor polymers, and they are breaking in the very end all the records in photovoltaics because of this, of course, uh, allows separation of charges, splitting of excitons, and this type of stuff, yeah. And we do the same. In a pool of carbon, we put little spots of other materials just to act as a localization site for electrons, but also a transfer site of electrons. This is, again, the public, uh, the public 
We make poker chips and we stack them spontaneously and we live from the fact that by the supramolecular stacking, of course, donor acceptors sit in certain alignments, which we have to try to control, I understand. I love this even more if you take a domino game. Even the pore formation is spontaneous because pores are encoded inside the structure. Good principle, you have to realize that in chemistry, of course. So this is one of the approaches which work out, and this is one of these DA things. Yeah, In the very end, it's not carbon, it's C2N, which is carbon subnitrite in this case, and the chemistry is super simple, we just use urea. Again, this is a forgotten chemistry from the, 90, uh, from the 1890s, yeah, and it works extremely well. For, for this audience, this is the precursor melt. It's a liquid state. Whenever a bubble is square-like, you know something is fishy, and you have liquid crystal. So the pre system pre-organizes. This is also birefringent, of course, so it's a liquid crystal melt. Yeah. At 500 gram, the material is silvery. It still develops already metallic character. This is very good, but if you zoom in very carefully, and here you have to believe me, you see the very funny layers, and you see also the cross layers. This is exactly this packing of nitrogen and carbon we were hunting for. And uh, porosity, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sad, I should be, show you better pictures, I, I agree. You see, this works out, you can make the C2N, and C2N, again, is one of these donor acceptor structures we have to build in, uh, into the carbons, as a second phase. Yeah. Brr, yes, I still have 50 minutes, this is okay. Going back to the simplest things, and again, David, you know that, yeah. Uh, this is a carbon cookie, and this carbon cookie was generated by making a salt melt synthesis of graphene. You already have seen there are low melting salt melts, but also high melting salt melts, and here we apply temperatures around 600 degrees centigrade, 800 degrees centigrade, so we can use even most ordinary salts. Zinc chloride has a certain advantage, I should say, because it's at the same time a Lewis acid, so we can run reactions. But nevertheless, this is how it works. Is it expensive? No. Bottle making, if you make a glass bottle, a wine bottle, it's eight cents per kilogram concerning the heat cycle, because, and of course the glass is heated to 800 degrees and cooled down again, yeah, because these are processes in the so-called soft temperature range of industry. Easy, 800, nothing. Yeah. So what is happening? We already know that from the first part of the talk that glucose, which we use, and here we use lithium chloride, zinc, potassium chloride, not to have a catalyst, that glucose uh, dissolves in salts under these conditions, and glucose is a perfect precursor of carbon, because the stoichiometry tells me it's C6 plus 6 H2O. Nothing left, so I can write down the equation. Yeah. What's happening is this, and I was attending the talk of Clément, this is how graphene looks like. So this is a 70 gram per liter synthesis of graphene. This graphene is completely synthetic. It was glucose before. It's hydrophobic, it has the famous bands, yeah. It's slightly disordered, of course, and if you crack it in pieces, do, do, do. Yeah, you see this is AFM, it's exactly flagged, yeah, and it has this funny Height, height one nanometer, two nanometer. I don't like that, yeah, you have to know that. And he also here, the height here is uh, presumably four nanometer, but I cannot read it. It's too big for graphene. If you do chemistry in a salt melt, you can do oxidation and reduction in a salt melt. You add just an oxidizing salt, for instance, lithium nitrate. So this is now really gunpowder, except that we moderated the oxidation. So we just put in a little of oxidation agent in an inert media, and you see, ah, yeah, indeed, obviously, the layers start to oxidize, they get holes, uh, works, yeah. This is thiosulfate uh, reducing, and then, indeed, the layers get very, very smooth, yeah. So they're, I, I think smooth is an effect of electron microscopy, it's an overcharging effect, you are losing conductivity because of reduction, yeah, but nevertheless, they look much better with the sulfur doping, yeah. And it contains 7% of sulfur in the structure, which is a surprise, because usually carbons should not contain 7% of sulfur in the structure. So re this reduction occurs, yeah, under transfer of the sulfur atom to the carbon. This is the problem with the structure. 
And it's maybe the teaching, if you see graphene, it's not graphene, not always graphene. If something looks lamella, it's lamella, but not graphene. Because if you do porosity measurements, and you now you're something like experts on that, yeah, this is not graphene. It's a microporous material. Yeah? Surface area for a 1 or 10 nanometer stuck much too high. So obviously, although these things look so beautiful, they contain too much heteroatoms, 10% nitrogen, 7% sulfur. How to put that into a graphene sheet? Yeah, and they contain, obviously, pores. So what is the secret of these graphene-like, not graphene, new polymorph of carbon? Yeah, you, you zoom, this is a layer, you see, looks nice. You zoom in, and it looks different. Yeah. So in the very end, we call it spaghetti or ramen face. Yeah. The, or tagliatelle is better. The little ribbons and the ribbons are put in a plane, but for, for some strange physical reason, the plane is exactly flat. If I put spaghetti on a plate, it should look like that. But no, the system absolutely keeps over the whole species the thickness constant. And I can show you another picture. This is modern microscopy now. You see, this is a single sulfur atom. This is another sulfur atom. We can measure the distance of sulfur atoms, and we know that the little tagliatelle are really lined by sulfur at the rim. So graphene, this, you, you make graphene ribbons, but they're not flat. They are coiled to some strange structure. And due to physics, the graphene ribbons prefer uh, to be packed in the plane. This is now sc scanning transmission electron microscopy. And I think this is the best way to see that these little sheets, which are seven nanometer thick, constant thickness, are really porous as such. Yeah, because now if you turn it around, you see the pores, yeah, and obviously it contains 7% sulfur. This is exciting, because in the very end, we now have made a very simple and cheap way to make these sheets. And in the sheets, in the holes, we can place something else. Because now we really can start to, to mix metals. These holes will fill up. And here I have, sorry to all physicists for this oversimplified uh, presentation to uh, explain you uh, the concept of Mochotki catalysis. This is the universe in energies of redox energies. And usually we say carbon is around hydrogen, is around zero. All things on this side, on the plus side, are called noble, gold, silver, platinum. And we already heard these are water reduction, water oxidation. These are limits of stability, which are important for chemists. Everything above that is, so to say, apt to drive reduction. And here is everything below that is apt to drive uh, oxidation. Yeah. And what is happening now if we take one of these, and let's take this one. It's, I know it's not carbon or endoped carbon. It's something with very lot. Of, if you take something like that and put the platinum on top, yeah, what will happen, of course, platinum, as it is less noble than this thing, yeah, will lose electrons and send it to the, to the support. So if we put platinum in such a porous material and the Fermi level is lower than the one of platinum, the platinum turns plus, and you can measure that with X pairs. Yeah. Why is it that important? Usually we have a Vulcano plot, a Trussati plot for catalytic reactivity, and you are either on the left or the right side. You are hardly on the top of the Vulcano. And by the turning of the substrate energy and the, the electrons you transfer there, you can move the Vulcano to the optimum place of reactivity. And this is the idea, of course, of these heterojunctions. It's non-innocent. You have the metal, yes, but the electron density of the metal is changed according to your catalytic wishes. This is one of these super catalysts. Yeah, so what you see here, a little, uh, now I have to look, it should be palladium, but I want to be sure, palladium. This is a palladium particle. It's very stable. It's, so to say, five nanometer. It's put on one of these sheets, and you have to know it, it's half in the holes of the sheets, and the electronic coupling is very, very tight. And we do something complicated with this hydrogenation of phenol, uh, and phenol is not an easy substrate, you have to understand. And you see 99s, 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 99s. We always run the reaction to completion, and it always goes to completion. The product in this case is cyclohexanone, and with very high selectivity. The real point is here. We use just one, 0.1, uh, so this is one uh, megapascal, so this is one bar. One bar hydrogen, we use 
room temperature, and we get 99% conversion. All of us chemists who do hydrogenation, they do it under temperature and pressure. This system hydrogenates a complicated substrate at room temperature at one bar of hydrogen. <coughs> so what you do, you blow up an aluminum sack yeah, with one bar of hydrogen, you put your thing in, and yes, there is a price you have to pay. The time is getting longer, 24 hours, 48 hours, 70 or two hours. But I, as I know, modern students and professor life, 70 hours, go home, perfect. Yeah, so this is what you can do. So this is more Schottky design. Thanks to these new carbons, we can do completely new catalysis because we can really control elect uh, electronic density within met metal particles. There are strange reactions because we are, usually we want to hydrogenate lignin, I have to admit that, yeah, because it's a 200 million ton waste product, good for fuels and so on, but the reactions are strange. So in the very end, if you take this one, you get the expected outcome, 99%. If you take this one, you see you even get a deoxidative hydrogenation, which was not in our frame of expectations. Okay. What did I show you? And I kept time. Very good. Yeah. Uh, first, I said carbon is not only gas phase and high temperature. There's a chemiduce of carbon. You can do it in water. And again, many people do now carbon dots. They heat water, citric acid. No, this is 100 years old, and we know for a long time this is carbon you can do. Yeah. Uh, supercapacitors, I will not report. I think, as I said, the world leading guy is coming next to me. I think they're promising and cheap, and in my BMW, I already have 20 kilograms of supercapacitors. It's a so-called microhybrid, yeah, and it's very, very good and powerful, I have to say. Yeah. Salt templating and salt flux synthesis, we can really control pores in carbon, the functionality of pores in carbons with angstrom precision, yeah, which gives, indeed, good choice for selection. And I told you about electrocatalysis, there are some dreamy reactions in electrocatalysis, like direct synthesis of H2O2 or formic acid production, which is done by carbons, and potentially just by carbons because of this very high selectivity for only one uh, reaction. Yeah. I was showing you the graphene chips, as we call them, with sulfur and nitrogen lining. Yeah. Family level design, we are just at the beginning, but this is something I would love to explore in the future. But the real message is make your own carbons. Don't take what's available because carbon is more than just the stuff you can buy. The, whoop, whoop, whoop. These are the people doing the job. I, I, I know Max Planck directors have many people. My carbon group is rather small, just eight people. It's a lot of fun, so I enjoy working with them. The, all the honor goes to them, and I thank you for your attention. <coughs>